and welcome everybody to another Nothing Like a Good Book. Thank you for your letters. Thank you for your emails. I do appreciate them from no matter where you are around the world. That's the beautiful thing about podcasting. You never know where you could end up. Let me ask you this question. How do you solve the Gen Z military recruiting crisis? Huh. Well, maybe uh, a Gen Z lieutenant has the answers. From the fear of mental health disorders to a lack of interest, this new generation is turning sharply away from the armed services. And that's scary. Unfortunately, this comes at a time of rising international tension. As you know, and you know, the United States military has reached an all time low when it comes to recruitment. And that's why this particular topic and on this book today, through uh, incompatible ideals, differing beliefs, and uh, socio-cultural factors, recruiters, they're struggling to connect with the younger generation. As a member of Generation Z himself, Second Lieutenant Matthew Weiss tackles the source of the problem, and he proposes solutions in this bestseller. And it's called, get ready, We Don't Want You, Uncle Sam, Examining the Military Recruiting Crisis Within Generation Z. Welcome, Matthew. Thank you so much for having me, sir. Well, uh, Matthew, Andrew um, uh, Bakovich, he's chairman and co-founder of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. And he says the U.S. military is in the throes of a sustained recruiting and retention crisis. Sustaining a viable force will require fresh thinking, innovative proposals, now, in this brilliant and timely book that you have penned, Matthew Weiss offers an abundance of both of those things. What do you say, Matthew? And that was rather a nice little uh, wrap for you there. Congrats on a bestseller. Indeed. No, I appreciate that. And I, I can positively say that everyone from uh, some senior level commanders in the Department of Defense to people in policy arm of the Department of Defense to the lowest level enlisted privates have found uh, some value in discussing this topic and using the book as a guide. So, so far the reception has been pretty, pretty strong and pretty positive. Hmm. Well, the current status of uh, military recruiting in the United States apparently is uh, terrifyingly grim. Uh, recruitment levels are at their lowest since the Vietnam era. Uh, and through personal stories and macro analysis, you're going to recall these issues as we get into the book. So what is the military recruiting crisis and why is it important for the military to recruit Gen Z people? Absolutely. So 50 years ago, the Gates Commission under Nixon canceled the draft and made our military a professional all-volunteer force. And it sustained us for the past 50 years through a rather peaceful time period. We've had some wars, notably Iraq and Afghanistan since then. But overall, we've had a very safe nation um, and decently safe time period. Unfortunately, with great power competition nowadays, we're seeing two major adversaries in the world really challenge our world balance and frankly, the balance of peace. And our military relies on people joining, signing up, enlisting, and desiring to serve the nation. So what we're seeing, unfortunately, is an extreme lack of that. And we're seeing people, Gen Z, my generation, and Gen Z is defined by the Pew Research as anyone born really between 1997 and 2012. We're seeing Gen Zers turn their back on the military. They're not signing up. The major services are missing their goals by thousands and thousands of people. And that really is starting to come to a breaking point where the country is going to have to look at our military commitments and potentially change or alter policy because we don't have enough people to man the front line for that matter. So that's the overview of the crisis and what's going on. Um, and then in the book, I get into why that's occurring and some ways that we can solve it. Basically. Mm. Well, uh, you know, in the book, you basically organize your point into four parts. So maybe it's a good idea if you share those with us, if you would. Absolutely. So the first part, and I think this is interesting for any listeners who just want to understand my generation, um, is just understanding what the basics of Generation Z is. 
So from a broad overview, Generation Z had three major events punctuate their lifestyle or their lives and one major underlying trend, which is technology. So the three events were, we were too young for 9-11. We didn't have that patriotic surge that many millennials had. Our first major world event was the Great Recession and the Great Financial Crisis in 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. We saw a lot of people lose jobs, a lot of the economy recede. We saw the 2016 divisive political election, regardless of which side anyone believed in or was rooting for, it was extremely divisive. Many Gen Zers who were excited to vote for the first time saw this intense political climate in the country really divided. And then in 2020, we had many of our high school times or middle school times, some in, in elementary school, mm -hmm. um, totally disrupted by COVID. So those three events are pretty broad and have really impacted our generation. Additionally, we have had technology literally at the elementary school, third grade, second grade level. So we're the first generation, unlike the millennials who got their phones and their apps, maybe in, in middle school or in high school, we had technology in elementary school. Mm -hmm. So we have a totally different innate understanding of technology, a lot of the knowledge and benefit of that, but also the, the intense mental health difficulties that came with that, the struggles in our minds that are from being always on and always having a device and always being connected. And so those overall sort of encompass my generation. And part one of the book, I sort of am explaining how each of these things plays into something uh, that that our generation has on the workforce. So one of them, I'd love to dive into one of my big insights is this level of competition. Mm -hmm. So Gen Z, for example, you know, there's the trope in America that, uh, everyone gets a trophy. We are raising the, everyone gets a trophy generation. And that was maybe very true for the millennials who, you know, they showed up to the soccer game and they got a participation trophy. It's very opposite for Gen Z. Gen Z is an innately competitive generation mm. for all the things I just stated specifically for social media, the second that I post on social media, I know instantly how well I did. I know how many likes I got, how many comments I got. I know how many likes John got and how many comments John got. Mm -hmm. I know how many likes Sally got. And so that competition concept is actually important for Gen Z. And it's something that we sort of seek out and understand innately and that some of our employers can incorporate into their everyday uh, workforce to actually inspire Gen Z or motivate Gen Z. Well, you know, there's, so the, there's the often repeated uh, expression that uh, 40 is the new 30, you know, for Z. A better trope would be that 30 is the new 20, uh, since you can become a better version of your past self. Now, this is an excerpt from your book, right? With further research and investment in anti-aging lifestyles, Science is delivering the first generation to live forever, or more, uh, you know, realistically, the first generation in modern times to achieve a massive five to ten year jump in life expectancy. So you look at Generation Z has grown up to primarily see physical violence as outdated and taboo. And while uh, cyberbullying rates and suicides have skyrocketed among Zers, Older style, you know, fisticuffs are not as common. Okay, then you also say that as the Republican Party fringe pushes the narrative that the military is engaging in woke political programs, you can explain all this, and the Democratic Party fringe accuses the military of rampant white supremacy and racism. The average Generation Z voter is confused, doesn't know what the hell to think. So why would they want to join an organisation where so many people have such opposing views about what is going on inside it. That's, that's very much on, isn't it, right now, in what America is going through, don't you think? Absolutely. So, I mean, that chapter 14 there, which is really diving into the political division, is a super key point. It's, it's arguably the most important chapter in the book. And what happens is you have these generals or admirals hauled in front of Congress and both parties on both sides, you know, use them to score political points and they attack this program or they attack that program, you know, for the quick two second sound bit or for just a way to, you know, score voting points. And there's really sort of an issue there because the military is apolitical. It must always remain apolitical, right? We serve, we take an oath to literally lay down our lives for the constitution which is a higher calling and a higher standard than a political party. And so Generation Z, 
while policy oriented, we care about policy. We're more informed about political policies than maybe any other generation. Mm. We're very tired and exhausted of this constant political division and fighting. And so the military has to be this one last standing area that isn't politically motivated, that is apolitical, that is truly a uniter of the nation because it's the defense of the nation and everyone benefits from common well, defense, that's it. right? That's exactly it. And I mean, that sucks because everybody suffers. You know, if you guys don't perform and do what, and do what you do well, uh, all because you can't even get directions, gear, uh, orders, uh, promotions, moves, because there's bloody political bias going on, it affects everybody. Right down to little old me, doesn't it? Exactly. It, it, it does. I mean, it's a huge bureaucracy, but that exists for a good purpose, right? And in the end of the day, we, we are trying to do a key good mission, and we want to be motivated for that. So for Z, you know, we want to have policy points. We want to be allowed to express policy and have normal discussions like everyday Americans in uniform and out saying, hey, this policy is this, this is that. But we don't want to be political cheerleaders for one side or the other, and we don't want to you know, have that, you know, very intense partisanship that goes on mm -hmm. infiltrate this, this institution that has so many different backgrounds and, you know, literally all of America is represented, you know, every single possible group is represented here in the military. That's right. So that's sort of a, a big issue. We need to reduce the political cheerleading and the rooting for candidates and such and the parties. And we need to encourage policy discussions, normal based united policy discussions of understanding different viewpoints uh, while in uniform. That, that's a key point for Z. You know, the irony um, in with what you've just shared, you know, and, and what goes on and all the crap between the parties, here's, here's the deal. You look at other countries, third world countries, and you wonder why they have coups, right? And their politics is shocking and, you know, they don't get anything done or anything else. And here we are looking in, but I tell you what, on the fringe of. Now, regarding actual uh, ideological schools of thought, uh, you also mentioned in the book that the recruiting establishment will have to create a careful balancing act. Now, although the military at large has a historically slightly conservative tilt in thought and voting patterns, and Gen Z at large has a historical slightly progressive tilt in voting and voting patterns, the DOD is going to have to figure out how to appeal to Zoomers with more progressive leanings without uh, alienating conservative groups that have historically been overrepresented in the forces. Now, to be clear, you do go on, and I want to ask you some questions. We're going to break down the 21. To be clear, nobody's arguing that the military should champion the use of alcohol or marijuana, marijuana, as I call it. There's no question that these substances have adverse health, psychological, and some performance effects. The first vision that comes to my mind is Vietnam. Uh, everybody was on it. And if you're in the jungles, I tell you what, I don't blame them. There were, uh, will hopefully remain a solid social stigma around using and abusing these substances in the military culture. Now, with that noted, the DOD needs to heavily re-examine how it treats the recruiting pool regarding marijuana. All right, share your thoughts on all that lot. Absolutely. So, so there's a few few points I bring out there. We can we can start backward and go go backward. We'll start with the marijuana point. Very simply, this generation is the first generation where marijuana has been legalized in many states, and we look at the two substances similarly, if not favorable towards one. And the point is, the military takes the old view of. It's okay to drink a beer on a Friday. It's okay to drink many beers on a Friday with the squad members, but it's not okay if you have one positive urine test with marijuana. You could be kicked out of the force instantly. So there's this perception among Zers that if I smoked marijuana in high school, I can't join the military or I can't smoke marijuana in the military. Why would I want to join? Mm. And so I think the military needs to understand that the generation itself looks at the two substances similarly and frankly, there's more usage of marijuana and less usage of alcohol. We're seeing that in some of the statistical surveys. People are decreasing in the, the amount of alcohol they drink and increasing the amount of marijuana they use. Regardless, the military shouldn't be a place that supports either of those substances. They're not very bodily healthy or bodily increasing substances, but they shouldn't be penalizing one 
so stringently over the other, right? They should really be understanding that this is just a generational trend. Gen Z smokes weed but doesn't drink as much as their parents. And that has to be sort of a an open discussion, as painful as that is for some senior commanders to have and yep. understand. Yep, you're, you're right, because look, here's the deal. They want to recruit or not. But I'm, you know, add, add to that. What's wrong with saying, look, we've got a... Uh, uh, I forget what it's called again, rehearsal coming up, you know, or we've got war games coming up or something or other. You're not allowed to smoke three days before, okay? Or we're going into this or we're going into that. You can't ever smoke a week before. You know, I mean, a little bit of common sense around it just to say, look, we're prepared to give, but you're going to give too because we really want to know you've got your faculties about you when the time comes to the crunch. And I guess that's what the commanders are really asking for, aren't they? Exactly, exactly. And, and the issue is like a lot of these common sense smart points fall apart, you know, with bureaucratic statutes and stuff. I think a lot of commanders would like to be have more leeway, have more common sensibility. But then you have some bureaucratic standards that and that's one of the things that I try to push on the book is we really need to examine these nuanced discussions exactly like you you accurately said. You're not mm-hmm. calling for everyone to be allowed to smoke marijuana every day, especially during an exercise or an operation. Mm-hmm. But you can make the nuance change of okay, you know, you you, you get pissed, you know, urine tested five days before an operation. But mm-hmm. up operation, those five days, it, you yeah. know yeah, up for those five days, you know, you know, you're not really gonna be checked. You're you're gonna be okay. You know, it's, it's just like having a beer, you know, you're, you're okay. He, he smoked a little bit, you know, like that would increase the freedom, quality of life of Zers mm-hmm. in the military. Mm-hmm. It'll give them an incentive, and oh, I don't have to, you know, give up everything uh, that I that I already used to do. I enjoy this substance, especially in garrison home life, um, and that's that. And so that that's it, it's a flex or it's a mm-hmm moving without actually decreasing the standard. I think one point I want to hammer home, we're not going to, we don't want to decrease the standard of the military. We want more people interested and we want better people interested for that matter. Mm -hmm. But we're going to have to understand what truly decreases the effectiveness and lethality of the warfighter and the military and what doesn't. So it's important to see, like, does that point actually make someone less capable as a warfighter if they are allowed now to recreationally, not during an operation, smoke marijuana? I don't think so. Therefore, I think it's a policy that you can give on. And yet, you know, went on in Afghanistan uh, during combat, went on in Vietnam. What do the commanders do there? But look, I shouldn't ask you that because there's a lot I want to get through here and we're going to run out of time. The book is called We Don't Want You, Uncle Sam, Examining the Military Recruiting Crisis with Generation Z. And the author is Matthew Weiss. You can look out for it. It's probably on Amazon, and we'll get to that where you can buy it. It's a bestseller, so it's got to have something great about it. And I tell you what, the more you get into it, the more you understand it. You go a step further. You break down the f- uh, 21 key points. This is what you're explaining here and how, uh, how you narrow down your book's purpose. A- and to do that, you know, the, the, with the four, now the 20. Well, in fact... Uh, you organize your point into four parts initially, right? That's recruiting fundamentals, workforce parity, socio-cultural influences, and then scope of service. Then you break it down into 21 points. See if you can wrap that up in five minutes. Yeah, absolutely. So I go from the basic, who is Gen Z? That's part one, right? There's there's seven chapters. I don't think I can go through all 21 points um, no, no, in no. the five minutes. Mm-hmm. But... Yeah, so who is Gen Z is part one, right? Understanding us, what motivates us, what time period do we get created in, you know, who who are we essentially as people, really? And this is great for, you know, a lot of business is that are trying to attract my generation and understand how these devices and these modern day actually impacted us. Part two is saying, okay, now that we understand who Gen Z is, how do we make military working conditions in line with Gen Z expectations of the modern civilian workplace. So the modern civilian workplace, we saw a lot of change, virtual work, COVID impacted things, new offices, different employer-employee relationships. How do we make the military, understanding there are a lot of limitations to that, we're not going to change all military structure, but how do we make it a place that relates to a Gen Z conception of a workplace? So how do you convince someone that maybe go going to McDonald's or working at McDonald's to actually put on a uniform and do maybe a similar job or a slightly different job in, in uniform. That, that's part two. Mm. Part three 
the social cultural influences are these now we're zooming back out right we started in the individual Gen Z are now getting a little bit larger. These are the aspects of larger American society that impact military recruitment. So this is everything from politics like we discussed and marijuana and substances that we discussed to mental health issues. What is the larger society trends going on all throughout America that are actually impacting directly this recruitment crisis? And then four, I sort of wrap up the book with the ways in which the military can give back to that society, the society that we're sworn to defend, the sworn to protect, what is the scope of service? What are ways that the military can find its purpose? Um, I divide my 21 recommendations into some requirements issues, right? Ways that we can change requirements and understand nuance and tactics and then perception issues. And the perception issues are larger viewpoints of the military, how the military operates mm. in the world, what is the purpose of it, and the larger ones. So those are the two breakdowns, basically. Okay, so you also write too, Matthew, the biggest, well, one of the biggest personal drivers for Gen Z is the desire to feel needed. Overall, being needed is perhaps the biggest self-interest trigger of them all. Now, what exactly do you mean by that? Absolutely. I think that Gen Z is trying to understand its place in the world, like any generation. But unlike other generations that had sort of these defined career paths or go to school, get a job, stay at the company for 20 years. Gen Z with a thousand different overloads of information is is exposed to the entirety of the world, everything everywhere all at once, if I can use that word, right? Um, and so we're trying to understand what is our purpose? How do we carve out a purpose, right? And we, we want to feel meaning and meaningful mm -hmm. in this constantly meaningless, you know, social connection, right? With people that get tens of millions of likes, how do I have meaning when I get five likes, right? For example. So I think the concept of being needed is one of the strongest motivators and the military definitely needs Z is one of the strongest motivators that one could have. I, I got this initial impetus for this concept in college. I had a great um, business leader speak to us and he explained he was working um, in a criminal rehabilitation program uh, where criminals for the first time were being let into the workforce. And this one individual who uh, was working for an exterminator company showed him a text and he said, you know, the text said, you're needed at this job site at 10 o'clock. And he said, this is the most important thing I've ever got. And he, he didn't understand. He was saying, why? What's so special about that text? And he said, I am needed. For the first time in my life, I am needed. And I think that relates to a lot of Zers. A lot of Zers, to be needed is such a meaning drive, such a purpose drive, such a value drive that I think there's something to that. Yeah, that's on the positive side. Then you look on the negative side, and over the years that I've interviewed all sorts of leaders of various organizations, and the one that worries me is always the after effect. And when you do think about the Zuma generation, I mean, even the Pew Research classifies anyone born between 97, 1997 and 2012 is a Zuma. Now, if you're listening, you're a Zuma and you're in that age group, right? Various unique reasons why you don't want to see the military as something that you want to be a part of. Fear of mental health disorders, right? That could happen. You smoke too much juice, you're going to get that anyway. But the lack of interest. This new generation is turning sharply away from the armed services. In a way, do you blame them with every day in the news of what vets aren't getting? Then again, vets are getting a lot on another hand. But when it comes to the medical and the mental, the after effects, that's enough to put anybody off, don't you think, Matthew? I absolutely agree. I think veteran treatment and perception is going to be goes into the perception issue, it, it's super important. So I think the mental issues of Iraq and Afghanistan, we grew up with that sort of in the background of our childhoods, have a huge perception effect on how Gen Z views the military. And Gen Z is statistically in all the data and all the surveys more mentally unhealthy than any generation that has come before. Maybe it's because of the devices, maybe it's the modern world, I don't know, I'm not trying to speculate. But I am trying to say and solve the fact that the military must be a place that cares first and foremost for the mental health of its people. And a lot of veterans will say, unfortunately, that they didn't receive the proper care mental health wise. And they struggle with the transition out and they struggled in with mental health. And so mm -hmm. the military really has to brand itself and prioritize as this great mental health place. If I can quickly give sort of the macro book thesis and one of the things I think so valuable mm -hmm. when I was 
conducting my interviews and my discussions, I uh, would always ask a few questions. And one of them I continually ask, probably over a thousand people right now that I've asked, would you do this again? Would you join again? And without fail, 100% said yes. Now, there's a confirmation bias there. I recognize that. But 100% said yes. So I realized there is some value proposition to the military. What is that value proposition? What is the core? And in my belief, my research, my core value proposition for the military is that it is the world's greatest physical social network. In this world of lack of connection, in this digital world that has all the social networks on social media, the military gives bonds, connections, and camaraderie stronger than any other workplace. Mm-hmm. And any other things you could do with your career, the friends that you make, it's more than friends, the peers that you are connected with for life, the people that you serve with that theoretically in combat are responsible for saving your life, mm-hmm. right? You have a deeper bond. And you hear this in movies and literature. You hear this over the years. It really provides that meaning and that connection that many years are looking for. So that value proposition exists and I think it just needs to be reawakened or unearthed and remarketed back to Gen Z in society to show this is really an answer for a certain subset of people that are interested in serving. Um, okay. In the short time that we do have left, I want to get through a few quick questions if we can. Uh, how did your time then uh, in the military influence this book? Absolutely. So I am very open with the fact that I just joined. I'm less than a year, about almost two years in basically. So I wrote the book right at the point of impact, meaning I was just recruited. I went through training and then I sat and thought, I said, hey, this is something I need to document and write about. So I personally have gained tremendous value and tremendous friends, as I said, from the military. But I've also at such a junior rank and such a junior level been able to speak about these problems because I observed them firsthand. Right. And that was, I think, valuable. Well, I think it's great. I mean, I tried to get my son to get into the military, but of course not. And uh, the reality is even Navy. I mean, you, you think all you ever really see is either the uh, the SEAL teams, Marines, or, uh, you know, the guys on the, the grunts on the ground doing the fighting. Uh, Air Force looked relatively safe, you know, if you love flying jets. And in the Navy, well, you're just cruising around the world, having a good time. <laughs> but the reality is you're, you're getting all your – your dentist paid for, uniforms, food. Uh, you think of it. They'll send you to college for four years, pay for that. God, if I had all over again, I'd tell you where I'd be going uh, because, mate, you couldn't beat it. And then the friends and the social media and the buddies for the rest of your life. Yeah, but you wouldn't like bullets coming at you. Come on, get some – hotspur up there okay so key ideas for recruiting i'd line up down the street to hang out with uh jays for everybody <laughs> and uh, and a nice half a dozen of uh, where are you now i think you're up there in australia somewhere forex maybe what's what's the big one in darwin these days tell me that's where he is at the moment the, uh, the the biggest way to, to attract people here in Darwin or what's the forecast in Darwin? Is that what you said? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was asking uh, what's the favorite beer up there at the moment? Oh, I'm always a Guinness man. Guinness, Guinness forever. For oh, me. There you there's, go. A, there's good Guinness beer. Yeah. Nothing like the Fosters that the Australians have. Right. Guinness forever. <laughs> yeah, I know. Now, Fosters is a real beer. If you line it up against anything here in America, mate, it, the others would fall over. You know, they just water. But listen, um, exactly. you know, how, uh, uh, okay, so if I wanted to buy this thing, We Don't Want You, Uncle Sam, by Matthew Weiss, examining the military recruiting crisis. And it is a recruiting crisis. I mean, I don't know, you know, you get this government chops the budget, there's nothing happening. You get The, 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 the word seems to be, look, there's never going to be wars like we had before. There's only ever going to be small teams, skirmishes, this, that, this, that. What's your theory on that, Matthew? So my theory is the following is warfare is changing. It's becoming technological, specialized. We need those things. That That, that is true. We're not going to deny that. But where we're losing on the recruiting crisis is on the periphery, meaning – We're always going to have a cadre in the country that wants to be a a Navy SEAL, that wants to be an infantryman. That's not who we're actually losing. You're losing the person who could very much do a supply job at Amazon or they could do it in uniform. You're losing the person that could be a cook in the military or could be a cook at McDonald's, right? right? And it's that periphery. Why would you do Amazon when you could do it in the military? Tell me. They all bitch and complain anyway about the hours and what goes on. 
You know? Exactly. You don't have that exactly. heart in the military. I mean, it's unbelievable. Listen, did you know that, uh, well, I'll tell you what worries me. Whether the military is getting enough brains. I mean, I would, I would fail because I'm, I'm way older than the, the era we're talking about. But technically, you know, uh, Vegas got a hit. I don't know if you know it or not, but it got a hit by hackers uh, a couple of days ago. And, mate, uh, 50 million ransom or some ridiculous thing. I'm concerned about the future that we aren't getting the bright boys in of what we need in the military. You're seeing it firsthand. What, what's the military doing there to also attract that level of competence? Absolutely. We, we need smart people, you know, and, and, and I will say anecdotally, very positively here in the Marine Corps, we have extremely smart people, extremely smart leaders. I've been very satisfied and happy with the people that I've met and who have taught me and challenged me. The point is we must continue that, right? We need super smart people. I went to a very intense business school and I was one of the few people that desired to go to the military. That's not self-aggrandizing. It's just simply saying I was shocked that it wasn't more of a thought for more of my peers at that school. And that's an issue. We need at the highest institutions, the best recruiting grounds possible, these smart people, technologically competent people, good leaders to lead our forces because that is what we demand. We, de- we need the best if we're going to win and mm-hmm. continue to keep our way of life. And so that's a super important point. Well, I'm not going to talk much more about where you are except the fact you are visiting Australia and it's nice to have you over there. We always open our doors to, uh, well, depends where you're from, whether you're a Yank or not. <laughs> because, <laughs> exactly. uh, to, you know, to Aussies, everybody's a Yank, but you're not. You've got to be south of the Mason-Dixon line. Uh, I've lived here for 20 years now, so you learn those things. But uh, it's a hell of a good book. God knows where it's going to take you with this, but we don't want you, Uncle Sam. Ah, oh, why not, my friend? We don't want you. Uh, examining the military recruiting crisis with Generation Z. Now, where can I buy this thing, buddy? The best place is just Amazon. That's the only place it's really being sold. Just go to Amazon.com. And we don't want your Uncle Sam. It'll pop right up. Or my name, Matthew Weiss, would probably pop right up. Okay. And no doubt it's on Kindle too, right? Yes, absolutely. An audiobook hopefully soon as well. <laughs> Very good. Are you going to do that? I am, I am, although I have a good voice here with you. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. Um, I'm open for offers, but then again, you you speak quite uh, eloquently, I think. <laughs> and I, I think you do that. a good job, so there you go. Thank you, thank you. Good luck with the book, my friend, and thank you for your service, okay? Good. Thank and, you so much. Hey, it's been a pleasure, and uh, good luck uh, with this. And come back to me if something big happens out of it, Okay. Absolutely. All righty. I will speak soon. Thank you. All right. See you, Lieutenant. Bye-bye.